Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, watching our uh, sermon uh, today on the cross. We're continuing our series on the cross, and today I would like to use as a text Romans chapter 5, verse 10. I've highlighted it on our um, on our PowerPoint. Let me pull the PowerPoint up here. There we go. I think people can see the PowerPoint now. Paul writes, I'll, I want to read the first two verses as well, and then verses 9 through 11, which is another paragraph. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. That's just such a wonderful verse. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were enemies, we have been reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received this reconciliation. So we began our study of the cross a few weeks ago by asking the question, what was happening when Jesus died on the cross? And we spent a couple of weeks talking about this. This takes us right to the heart of the gospel because we learned here that what was happening on the cross was that Jesus, God was offering up his son, Christ, to be a curse-bearing substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. He was bearing in his own body the curse and punishment that we deserve. And But we've moved from what happened on the cross to uh, the accomplishments of the cross, the achievements of the cross. What were its effects? What are the results? And so we've turned now to what was happening on the cross with Christ uh, being offered up voluntarily as a, a curse-bearing substitutionary sacrifice for sins to consider uh, what his death has accomplished. And what happens is this takes us to some very important words. Uh, we began last week by looking at this word propitiation, which means to appease God's wrath. And, and uh, today and next week, I would like to talk about this wonderful word, reconciliation. And in weeks following, God willing, these wonderful words of the gospel, redemption and justification and so on. These are all words that God uses to describe this salvation that was accomplished when Jesus died on the cross as our curse-bearing substitute uh, for our sins. And we call all of this that happened good news. And so God describes what he's doing for us in words. And these are wonderful words of the gospel. Our main verse there is Romans chapter 5, verse 10. When Paul wrote, he said, For if, while we were God's enemies, we have been reconciled through, his, through the death of his son to him, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And so we want to begin by asking, what was the problem? What's the problem that's being addressed in this verse and in reconciliation? Well, Paul points out the problem. He says, for if while we were God's enemies, you see, we were enemies. Uh, that's the problem. Reconciliation is set forth as the opposite of being enemies. We were enemies, but now we are reconciled. And if you go back to verse one, again, we, we read, therefore, having been justified through faith, we have peace with God, you see? Reconciliation uh, brings us from a state of being enemies to a state of being at peace with God. And so, Reconciliation is the removal of this enmity and God's wrath that was against us 
replacing it with uh, this friendship. Uh, last week, we talked about propitiation. Well, it means to appease God's wrath. It's an appeasing of wrath. And God was against us. His wrath was against us because of our sins. This week, you might say the emphasis is more positive because now we're talking about um, being reconciled, not just having the, the wrath uh, removed, but now there's something positive uh, in its emphasis that is friendship with God. So uh, propitiation re or appeasing God's wrath, uh, that, that takes away this anger, that just wrath that is against us. Reconciliation takes it a step further. You see, it's one thing for a person that you've committed a crime against maybe to no longer be righteously anger, angry and legally angry with you and to no longer demand punishment for that crime, but it's uh, another thing altogether for that same person to embrace you as his or her friend. That's what happens with reconciliation. Dana and I um, had a friend, she passed away, but um, it, this lady was a friend of Dana since birth and, and, um, and was a friend of mine as well. But one time she called Dana up and she said, uh, Dana, I ran over pedestrian. I hit a pedestrian by, well, you can imagine what Dana and I were wondering, like, what, you know, uh, that's all that she told us. But imagine, let's say that you accidentally ran over someone and you broke their legs. You're, you're totally at fault and you run over someone. Well, the law is against you and that person is against you because they've lost their salary and they've lost, they have a lot of medical expenses. And uh, it, it's one thing you see for the law to be against you. And it's an, a one thing for uh, that person to be against you. Uh, their expenses you see to be um, against you and to be satisfied, you see, but uh, it's another thing altogether for um, them to become your friend. After, let's say they pay the bills, they pay all the expenses. See, that's another thing altogether. That's what was happening when Jesus died on the cross uh, for those who have been justified by faith. He replaced his hostility that was against us with the state of friendship. And we, uh, both uh, of us were hostile toward each other. You see, this enmity between God and man is twofold. There's man's hostility toward God, and there's God's hostility toward man. Uh, first of all, there's man's evil and unholy enmity and hostility toward God. This is what we are by nature. Our mind, Paul says in Romans 8, verse 7, is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It's impossible in that state to submit to God's law. But this enmity between God and man is not only on man's part, it's also on our part, God's part toward us. You see, sin has resulted in a righteous and holy enmity and hostility on God's part toward us. And this is what Paul emphasized in the first three chapters of Romans, uh, most of the first three chapters. He begins uh, the good news about the gospel with talking about the wrath of God in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. And for the rest of Romans chapter 1 and, and all of Romans 2 and most of Romans 3, he describes this enmity of God against us because of our sin. And we read this elsewhere in the New Testament as well. We read that um, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them, you see. So we, we read about this hostility. It's twofold. It's not only man's wicked, evil hostility and enmity against God. It's also God's righteous and holy enmity against man because of sin. So uh, is this reconciliation a removal of man's enmity toward God, or is it a removal of God's enmity and 
uh, uh, and hostility against us sinners. Well, it's God's hostility toward us that is removed. That's the emphasis. Well, how do we know? Well, there's several uh, passages, but um, let me give you a passage. Well, the passage itself in Romans 10 there, verse 5 points this out, but let me give you some other places where this word is found generally in the New Testament uh, re re concerning reconciliation. Uh, we read in the Sermon on the Mount, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother or sister has something against you, Jesus said, leave your gift in front of the altar and go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. So what does it mean for you to go to your brother and sister and remove the enmity um, that you have? Is it uh, the enmity that you have toward them, or does it mean the enmity that they have toward you? Well, clearly, uh, Jesus is pointing out they have enmity or hostility toward you, and you become aware of that. There's no mention that you have something against your brother or sister. That's not the focus of Jesus' words here. The problem is your brother or sister has something against you, and for you to go to them to be reconciled uh, and take care of whatever that is so that you can be reconciled. Well, in the same way, to be reconciled to God by the death of Jesus Christ is not about uh, us removing our enmity against God. It's about God removing his hostility and enmity against us and that's how the language is used also in the new testament as we, elsewhere as we've seen so we see this uh, again in this um, passage and i want to back up a verse and show you how that this is used uh, and we see this in the parallel between verse 9 and verse 10. paul said since we have now been justified by his blood how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we have been reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? There's, there's, Paul is making a, a parallel statement in verse nine and verse 10. I want you to look at it. He says, uh, we have now been justified, verse nine, look at verse 10 we have been reconciled to him. Those are parallel statements. Um, and you'll notice there in the passive voice, we have been justified, we have been reconciled. In other words, the action is being done to us. We're not performing the action, we're receiving the action. Let me give you an example. The boy hit the ball. The boy is performing the action of hitting. That's the action. And what's receiving the action is the ball. And so, but if you change that sentence around and you put the ball as the subject and you make this a passive voice, you could say the ball has been hit by the boy. Now the ball, it's still receiving the action, but it's but the verb is in the passive voice. And the the one who is uh, administrating this action is the boy still, but we put the verb in the passive tense, a voice. And so that's what we see here in our passage. We have been justified. We is the subject, and we are being acted upon. We don't justify. God is the one who justifies. We have been reconciled. We don't do the reconciliation. We have been reconciled. It's being done to us. This is a work of God. And we see that it is through the death of his son. That's, it's a finished, by the way, this, this is verb uh, indicates that it's a completed action. It's a finished action. And we see something else in this, uh, in the next verse as well, we see the same thing that not only is this so, Paul says, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received uh, now this reconciliation. So uh, reconciliation is something that we receive. It's something that is on God's side, and we receive it by faith as a gift. 
as Paul says in Romans 3, 20, uh, uh, 25. He said, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of appeasement, a propitiation, you see, appease God's wrath through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. So uh, this is a wonderful passage teaching us about uh, reconciliation and who's doing the work in reconciliation. But I want to emphasize now this idea of um, uh, the idea of who is actually performing the action. This is stated over and over. We see that God is the cause. He's the moving action of our reconciliation. Um, we read, for example, in 2 Corinthians 5.19, it was God who was in Christ reconciling us to himself. Or Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. Well, how did Paul do that? How did God demonstrate his love for us? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God is reconciling. He's acting to reconcile us to himself through the death of his son. That's what God did, you see, to shower his love upon us and do it in a manner that's consistent with the full vindication of his holiness and justice and his wrath, righteous wrath against us because of our sins. You see, the question is, how could God extend his love toward us as sinners and save us without compromising his perfect nature, uh, which includes his perfect justice? How could God show his love toward us and be just at the same time? Because he's, he's loving, he doesn't want us to perish. But he's also perfect in justice and holiness, and he must punish sin. So how does he do it? Well, this is how he did it. He says we're reconciled to God in the death of his son. He demonstrated, you see, his love toward us in giving his son. John would say the same thing. He says this is love. Not that we love God. We didn't go after God. God pursued us but that he loved us and he, God, sent his son as this wrath appeasing sacrifice. That means propitiation for our sins. And so the greatest demonstration of God's love is the way that he rescues us from his own wrath and he makes us his friends and at what a great cost. And so um, let's look now at what Paul says in the conclusion of this verse. He says, for what, if while we were God's enemies, we have been reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? You see, if while we were enemies, we've been reconciled, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? If God's done that for us, uh, if he saved us and reconciled us to himself when we were enemies. That's the greater. And he gave up his son. He didn't spare him, Romans chapter 8 teaches, so that he could be reconciled with us. How much certain, how much more certain, the lesser, now that we're reconciled friends, will we be saved on the last day? In other words, we have absolutely no reason to fear the final judgment. If God did that for us when we were enemies, if he reconciled us, you can be absolutely sure that he'll save you when you're reconciled to him on the final judgment. You see, what Paul is doing is, is he's arguing from the greater to the lesser. Let me give you an illustration. Um, and I gave this illustration a few weeks ago, but it's really a good illustration for the way that John and Paul argue, even Christ, uh, in the Bible, God uh, uh, argues this way from the greater to the lesser. Um, in this illustration we gave a few weeks ago, we suppose that this five-year-old boy, Sammy, moves in with his parents into this new house in, in a new neighborhood. And in their first night in this house, during the middle of the night, the house catches fire. And this five-year-old boy, Sammy, is fast asleep. And his parents are unconscious because of the, the smoke. But a neighbor, a man by the name of Mr. Jones, he lives a couple of doors down. And he happens to see this house on fire. 
and he rushes into this burning house and he rescues this young couple, the parents. Well, when the parents are outside, they're revived and they tell him that their five-year-old boy, Sammy, is still inside that burning house. So Mr. Jones rushes back into this house while it's on fire and he wets a blanket and he wraps Sammy around it and he carries him out to safety. But because he did so, Mr. Jones suffered terrible burns that took months to get over on his face and body and, and burns and scars that he'll wear on his face uh, now the rest of his life. Well, over the next few months, Mr. Jones and this five-year-old uh, little Sammy become fast friends. Sammy loves Mr. Jones as much as any little boy's ever loved a, a grandparent. And, and of course, Sammy loves this little Sammy uh, as well. Mr. Jones loves little Sammy as much as any grandparent has ever loved a grandchild. For Sammy's sixth birthday party, uh, he only has a few friends because he's new to the area. But the one friend he wants most of all to come to this party is his friend, Mr. Jones. Well, Mr. Jones and his wife are going to be away on vacation that week. They've already planned to be away that week. But Mr. Jones promises Sammy that he will come back to be at Sammy's birthday party because Sammy's more important to him than that vacation. But Sammy, as the birthday begins to draw near, um, he begins to worry and he confides with his mother about his worries, about whether Mr. Jones will come back and be at his birthday party or not. Uh, he tells his mother, maybe he doesn't care for a little boy like me. After all, as well, they're on vacation. Well, here's what Sammy's mother says to him. She says, Sammy, Mr. Jones loves you. He saved your parents' life. He saved your life. He, he suffered great burns on his body. He risked his life to save you and to save your parents when he didn't even know you. He's proven his love for you ever since. You've become fast friends. He loves you very much now that he knows you. Now, if he would do all, all of that when he didn't even know you, he would risk his life to save you and your parents. And But now that you're friends for many months, don't you think Mr. Jones will keep his promise and come to your birthday party? Now, do you see what Sammy's mother is doing? She's arguing from the greater to the lesser. If he would do the greater, risk his life for you and your parents when he didn't even know you, how much will he do the lesser, come to your birthday party now that he knows you and loves you very much personally? Well, that's what Paul's doing here. That's what John does. That's what Jesus does. That's what God does throughout his word. You see, if we're reconciled, Paul says here, to God through the death of his son, when we were enemies, how much more, now that we're friends, reconciled friends, will he not save us in the final judgment? Paul uses this argument several times in Romans alone. Another uh, verse that where Paul uses this argument is in chapter 8, uh, verse 31 and 32. He says, if God is for us, he's already proven that he is, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Do you see the force of this argument in both of these verses? If God didn't even spare his own son for us, if he did that for us while we were enemies, you can be assured that he will also give us all things. And that all things includes the same thing as in our text, our final salvation. You see, the most important part of our final salvation was reconciliation. And the price that was paid was nothing more than uh, nothing uh, less than the death of his own son. But now having dealt with that problem, the rest is sure to come. You see, this he's, he's wanting us to feel the assurance of our final salvation, the certainty. I want you to listen to some of these wonderful words. 
Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore, Christ is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Do you know what Jesus has been doing for the last 2,000 years? He's been praying. He's been praying for his people. His standing there is assurance of our final salvation. Listen to these wonderful words in Jude 24 and 25. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Wouldn't that be wonderful to have this assurance and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. You see, he keeps us from falling away. And then there's these wonderful words in Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. There is now, is is present tense. There is now, to emphasize it, right now, <clears throat> No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, there's no condemnation for us right now. Right now, presently, there's nothing against us. And then we have our text in Romans 5, verse 10. And we also have this passage here earlier in Romans chapter 5, where Paul says we have a hope and assurance that will not Put us to shame. Well, it will never disappoint us. It will, he will, God will never let us down. He will never disappoint us. That hope of salvation that comes through faith in the work of his son on the cross will never disappoint us. And, and I love this passage here in Romans uh, chapter 10, just a few verses over, where Paul says, Moses writes about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith um, says, do, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, that is, the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. And there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? This is why I preach the gospel. They're not, people aren't going to be believers and, and, and uh, they're not going to, to have this faith that we'll see here in verse 17, unless we preach to them. And how can anyone preach unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? And then he says this, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. So these are beautiful words, you see. Uh, this, is, these, this is the conclusion of this section uh, of reconciliation. The conclusion is salvation, you see. We've been reconciled, and so we will be saved. There's peace, reconciliation. Look at what Isaiah uh, 52 verse 7 says. We uh, Paul quotes this that we just saw in Romans 10, but the rest of it, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. This is good news. Reconciliation is good news. Who proclaim peace. See, reconciliation's peace. We were once at enmity with God. Who bring good tidings. You see, have good news. This news that we tell people, this good news message is, 
is good news. It's about God, what he did for us in Jesus on the cross, who proclaims salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. And then uh, in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those upon whom his favor rests. You see, this is a message as we read in um, as we read in uh, Acts chapter 10, this is the gospel of peace. And in Psalm 116, you know, a lot of people think God's work of Jesus on the cross was not very successful. And they point to things, you know, I grew up myself pointing out things like the flood, only eight people were saved. Very few people are going to heaven. Very few people are saved. And uh, sometimes people will go to um, the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew 24 and misapply that passage. It's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Or 1 Peter 4, where very few people will be saved, also talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And they'll apply it to the final judgment and say, very few people are going to be saved. Well, you know, John saw with his own eyeballs in Revelation chapter 7, a great multitude that no one could count. There's not going to be eight people like the flood up in heaven. But this work of God on the cross was very successful. John said, and this is what he actually saw up there, it was a multitude no one could count. I can count pretty high, but there are many people who can count much higher than me. And he said they were out of every nation, every, uh, the word nation there is from the word ethnos. It means ethnic group, literally, not just America, but every ethnic group in America, every tribe, that's a family unit within ethnic groups. There's many family units within ethnic groups and people and language. There's many languages in the world today and many have already died. But all these people are up in heaven. They're all standing around the throne and standing before the Lamb. You see, a lot of people are going to be saved because of the work of God on the cross. In fact, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where there's people who are saved in the Corinthian church that were at one time sexually immoral. They were idolaters. They were adulterers. They were homosexuals. They were thieves. They were people who were greedy and drunkards and slanders and, and swindlers. And he said they were sanctified. They were washed. They were justified. We're justified by faith. Our legal standing becomes right with God by faith, Paul tells us over and over again in his letters. And so these people were in the church at Corinth. Their previous life, was very sinful, but they have been saved. And that's the way it is with God's people. And, and you remember there was a man up on the Temple Mount, and he was a very evil man. He, the Bible describes him as a tax collector. When you think of tax collectors, think mafia. Evil man. And he had done more evil than probably anybody would even be able to count in his lifetime. He knew that he had nothing to commend himself to God for. And he went up there. He wouldn't even look up into heaven. He knew that it was so pathetic. He just smote his breast. He said, God, propitiate. The word literally is propitiate or appease your anger against me. Because he knew he couldn't do it. He knew he had nothing to commend himself to God for. But the Bible says Jesus said he went home justified. We're justified by faith. He put his faith in God to do something for him because he knew I can't do it. But there was another guy there, by the way, and he was real religious. He went to church his whole life and he never did anything wrong. You know, a lot of these people think they've never done anything wrong because they only count big sins. And he identified a few like committing adultery, stealing. I haven't done any. I have been arrested. And you look in the Bible, Old and New Testament, and the people who were condemned were religious people by God many, many times. 
because their confidence is in their religion and how that they're better than a lot of people. But there's no one righteous before God. And the only people that God justifies are the wicked. It's only going to be, heaven's only going to be filled with people who committed terrible acts, including murder. But they've repented. They've come to God in faith. They've thrown themselves at his, at his feet and cried out for mercy. And God has received them because they put their confidence in him to save them. And in his work in Jesus on the cross. This is wonderful good news. You know, a lot of people say, no, that's not good news that those people are saved and, and not me. That wouldn't be fair. That would not be fair if God saved, you know, these wicked people. And, and I've never done anything like that. And I go to church all the time. I even have Bible studies, lead Bible studies. That wouldn't be fair if they went to heaven and I didn't. Well, I want to tell you something about heaven. Heaven is not fair. If it was about fairness, nobody would be saved. It's not about fairness. It's about grace. It's very unfair. It's a gift to us. And it's a gift that is received by faith. Well, what a uh, wonderful uh, salvation. What wonderful good news. We've been reconciled to God. And I want to ask you now as we close here, have you received this reconciliation by faith that God has already accomplished? It's a done work that he's accomplished on the cross for you, a needy sinner. Everybody is a needy sinner. You see, this is good news that he's extending this. He's removed his just and holy wrath against you because of your sins in the death of his own son. He in his own son offered him up so that we could be reconciled to him. You know, in his wonderful book, What's So Amazing About Grace, uh, by Philip Yancey, a few years ago, I read through this book several times because it's so wonderful. It's a beautiful book. But in this book, he tells a story. Uh, he relates a story by Ernest Hemingway. And Ernest Hemingway tells about a Spanish father who decided to reconcile with his son who had run away to Madrid. And being remorseful, the father took out an ad in in the local newspaper and the oak local uh the ad ran like this paco meet me at hotel montana noon tuesday all is forgiven papa well paco is a common name in spain and when the father went on tuesday to this square he found 800 young men named paco waiting for their father well, that's what our father wants. He wants reconciliation. Don't you want this reconciliation as well? And he's not asking you to contribute anything toward this salvation. In fact, you don't have any good works that you can contribute toward it. Thankfully, he's done it all for you. It's a finished work. He desires reconciliation so much for you that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, whoever. I've said this before. I'm so grateful that Jesus didn't say there, if Jimmy Cutter believes in him, because I would think there could be another Jimmy Cutter, and he may not be talking about me. But he said, whoever, it doesn't matter who you are, red, yellow, black, or white, male or female, whatever nationality you are, whatever ethnic group, he said, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Won't you receive this reconciliation, this wonderful gift? Well, may God bless you. And as I said, next week, God willing, uh, in our next lesson, I will uh, again attempt to uh, teach on this wonderful concept of um, reconciliation. Well, may God bless you. Goodbye.